Hello, uh, fellow biologist. Welcome back. We now come to the final um, lecture video uh, for chapter 11. And uh, this uh, final video actually covers two sections, sections 11.5 on cell cycle regulation and sections 11.6 uh, on um, cancer. Your reading assignment for uh, section 11.5 uh, is found in uh, pages 241 through 244 of your textbook. Uh, the uh, major learning objective of 11.5 uh, is for you to be able to explain how and why the cell cycle is regulated. The uh, sub um, objectives are first explain the function of cyclins and cyclin dependent kinases, or CDKs for short in regulating cell division. Uh, second, to relate the activation of CDKs to cell division. Third, to predict the effects of altering specific cyclin CDK complexes on progression through specific phases of the cell cycle. Uh, fourth, or I'm sorry, relate the importance of cell cycle checkpoints to progression through stages of the cell cycle. And uh, fifth, to describe the role of P53 protein in regulating the cell cycle. For the uh, self-assessment questions, uh, please try to answer the following questions. First, what are the roles of cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases in the cell cycle? And um, second, what are the three examples of, or what are three examples of checkpoints that the cell monitors before proceeding through the cell cycle? The core concept concerning the regulation of the cell cycle is that the cell cycle is regulated so that cell division occurs only at the appropriate time and place. Um, mitotic cell division occurs during the growth of a multicellular organism, as we already um, uh, explained in uh, mitosis section in wound healing and also in the maintenance of actively dividing tissues such as the skin and the lining of the intestine. Uh, cell division cannot occur all the time because uncontrolled division is dangerous and it can lead to um, cancer. The uh, progression through the cell cycle is an exquisitely and um, highly or precisely controlled um, process and it's controlled by a large family of, of diverse types of proteins that appear and disappear in a uh, cyclical fashion and um, by several enzymes that become active and inactive uh, also in cycles. The uh, family of proteins that appear and disappear cyclically are called cyclins. So how do cyclins work? Uh, cyclins actually uh, bind to and activate uh, cyclin-dependent kinases in order to control um, progression through the cell cycle. The binding of cyclin to um, uh, cyclin-dependent kinases or CDKs causes a conformational change in um, the CDKs and activates them as a kinase. And the kinase then targets in complex with the cyclin uh, tar uh, various target proteins, not just one, but multiple target proteins, and uh, phosphorylate them and allowing these phosphorylated to, uh, proteins to uh, be activated in turn in order to um, uh, perform their function, as we will see um, in the uh, subsequent slides. So this is, again, you're reminded of the signal uh, transduction pathway that we uh, studied in chapter five. Um, so this um, uh, mechanism is actually uh, uh, central to the operation of the regulation of the cell cycle. Okay, so it is this um, process that allows cell cycle to proceed in a sequential uh, manner. The um, uh, cycling actually uh, goes up and down in levels because once the uh, target proteins gets phosphorylated, then the cyclin is degraded by uh, proteases, 
or enzymes that um, degrades uh, proteins, and then um, and the cyc the cyclin will then get um, uh, inactivated as a result of that, and then at some point in the cycle, uh, cyclin again gets synthesized by translation uh, by, by the ribosome, and then the the whole cycle starts all over again. It is important to note here that um, in contrast to cyclins, the, uh, the partner of the cyclins, the CDKs, are always present in the cell. They are very stable in terms of uh, uh, their uh, existence or their presence, uh, but they are only active with the appropriate cyclin binding to them. So without the cyclins, uh, despite the fact that the CDKs are always present, they would be inactive. The uh, discovery of how uh, cyclins uh, work um, in order to uh, drive the progression of the cell cycle is a very interesting story uh, that eventually won the uh, Nobel Prize for its um, discoverer, uh, Tim, Tim Hunt, and other collaborators. Uh, so in the How Do We Know section of your textbook, uh, it, it's outlined there how this discovery was made. So uh, to better understand events in the cell cycle, this English biochemist by the name of Tim Hunt and his co-workers measured uh, protein levels in uh, uh, lowly sea urchin uh, embryos as they uh, divide rapidly by uh, mitosis. Uh, they used sea urchin because it is very easy to actually uh, visualize under the microscope uh, the uh, events that are happening in the embryo as it uh, as they develop. Now, uh, Tim Hunt added radioactive methionine. So the radioactivity here is uh, a way to um, uh, measure the uh, levels of uh, the uh, protein that is being expressed. And they use radioactive methionine, which of course, as we know, is an amino acid, which is a component of a proteins. And um, they, uh, he added this radioactive methionine to eggs which then become, uh, became incorporated into any newly synthesized proteins. And then the eggs were then allowed to fertilize and then develop. And uh, samples of the rapidly dividing embryos were taken every 10 minutes. Uh, so they did a time course experiment, and then they ran an electrophoresis gel to, in order to visualize the levels of different proteins. So the gel is just a way of separating um, newly synthesized proteins into um, uh, according to their sizes. So it can, you can visualize a whole mixture of proteins this way. So the, uh, the results were quite intriguing, quite interesting. Although most protein ba bands in the gel became darker, and which uh, when, when bands became darker, it uh, indicates that they increased in their levels as cell division proceeded, the level of one protein band oscillated. So, of course, we expect that um, majority of uh, proteins would uh, increase in their protein levels because you're increasing the number of cells as the cell divides during embryogenesis or, um, well, I'm sorry, em embryonic development. Uh, so the, uh, this one particular protein, however, oscillates in its level uh, increasing in intensity and then decreasing with each cycle as shown in the graph. In fact, what is, if, if, if you look carefully at the graph, it is interesting that the um, uh, level gradually increases uh, right after, uh, uh, around the beginning of interphase and then peaks at, uh, during the M phase or mitotic phase and then suddenly drops towards the end of uh, mitosis. Okay, until the um, early stages of interface, and then at around um, uh, mid interface, it stops. It starts to rise up again, and does so in a very cyclical manner, and peaking at uh, mitosis again or M phase, and then drops again. So uh, this is a very intriguing result. But the question is, what does it mean? Um, although they did not know its function. Its uh, fluctuating level suggested, however, that it might play a role in the control of the cell cycle. It is very common in science that um, 
two seemingly unrelated uh, research done by uh, two different groups um, sometimes converge and dovetails in order to um, um, uh, reveal a very fascinating uh, phenomenon. And this is the case for uh, the uh, problem of progression through the cell cycle. Although Tim Hunt could not figure out exactly what the role of cycling is, uh, there is another uh, group working in the early 1980s uh, that uh, uh, discovered that inhibition of protein synthesis blocks key steps of cell division in sea urchins. Now recall in our previous slide that the uh, cyclins appear to be regulated by degradation and synthesis. Uh, it was also known that an enzyme called M phase promoting factor, this is the name that um, this group in the 1980s uh, called them, is important in the transition from G2 to M phase. Um, MP M MPF, turns out, was found to consist of a cycling protein and a cycling dependent kinase or CDK that play a key role in the G2M transition. Therefore, cyclins um, control progression through the cell cycle by their interactions with CDK. As a result of this wonderful discovery, uh, in 2001, Tim Hunt shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his work in, on cyclins. So let's take a pause and uh, try to answer this RIF question. So please open your RIF account and um, answer this following question. Uh, or questions, in fact, there are two. Which one of the choices would most likely contribute to uncontrolled cell proliferation? That is cancer. A, a mutant cycling that cannot bind to its normal CDK binding partner. B, a mutant enzyme needed for microtubule synthesis polymerization. C, a mutant CDK that was active in the absence of its cycling binding partner. D, a mutant DNA synthesis mechanism causing blocked chromosome replication. Or E, a mutant kinetochore protein that causes reduced microtubule attachment. So let's have a closer look at these uh, cycling uh, CDK complexes. Um, so it turns out that several different cyclins and CDKs act as uh, specific steps uh, to drive the uh, cell cycle uh, progression forward. The uh, uh, first type is called the G1S cycline CDK complexes, and they are active at the end of G1, right here, this group here. And the green... Um, uh, line uh, indicates when, when the uh, cycling CDK complex uh, uh, are in uh, the cell cycle in this figure. Okay, so uh, the uh, G1S cycling CDK complexes, there are two types. Uh, this, there's cycling D CDK and cycling E CDK. Um, these are different types of cycling. Um, they prepare the cell for DNA replication, and that is the reason why they are most active. Uh, towards the end of G1 because they are preparing the cells to uh, proceed or to enter into um, the S phase of the interface. Uh, so that is how um, the uh, G1S cycling uh, drives the uh, interface from G1 to the S phase. So um, examples of what they do is that they promote the expression of histone proteins they regulate the translation of histone proteins that are needed for packaging uh, the newly replicated DNA strands. Um, they are also uh, important in, uh, of course, uh, producing some of the uh, regulating in the production of the materials that uh, might be needed in the synthesis of uh, proteins like uh, DNA replication factors and others that are related to DNA uh, synthesis process. The uh, second group of, uh, uh, of cycling CDK complexes are called the S1 CDK complex. And this, if you notice, are very active, in fact, at, uh, at both S phase and in fact, all the way onto uh, G2 uh, phase. 
uh, but they all uh, start to become active during the uh, S-phase uh, period. And the main role of S-cyclin CDK complex, among many other functions, is to activate protein complexes that are involved in DNA replication that contains enzymes that are necessary for uh, DNA synthesis. And then finally, we have the M-cyclin CDK complexes, or the cyclin B CDK, that helps uh, prepare the cell for uh, mitosis. So for example, they uh, actually help uh, regulate events that are involved in the breakdown of uh, uh, a nuclear envelope during prophase, which is of course, uh, as we have seen um, in um, mitosis and even in my, uh, meiosis, uh, which is a critical step in order for um, chromosomes to start uh, moving around. So then um, this, this breakdown of the nuclear envelope is therefore regulated by M-cyclin CDK. And they are also very critical in the uh, formation of the mitotic spin spindle. So what you notice here is that each of these uh, cyclin CDK complexes have distinct types of cyclins, okay? For G1S cyclin, you have cyclin D and E. For the S cyclin CDK, you have cyclin A as the um, responsible cyclin and the M and the M cyclin CDK complexes have cyclin B. So that's why I have said earlier that there are uh, uh, a large family of uh, uh, different members of cyclins. Now let's have a look at another aspect of the cell cycle. So the previous slides uh, focused on how cell uh, cycle progress from one stage to another. Uh, in, in, in this particular um, section, we would focus on checkpoints. Uh, so we have seen that in order for cell cycle to proceed successfully, they have to take place in a very specific order. And there are uh, many preparatory steps that happen in one stage in order to facilitate the uh, uh, entry into the next uh, stage. So checkpoints are therefore in place in order to regulate the progression of um, cell cycle. So one aspect of cell cycle is progression. We have seen that it is uh, cyclin CDK complexes that drives this progression, but there is also a layer of regulatory machines okay, or, or, or uh, complexes made up of proteins as well, or network of uh, interacting proteins that uh, checks this um, process. So their function is regulatory in nature. So cells have many uh, cell cycle checkpoints, in fact, where they can pause the cell cycle if something is not right before progressing to the next stage. And there are three major well-studied checkpoints. And uh, first, is the DNA replication checkpoint. And of course, it is important uh, for DNA replication to be monitored for quality control. Um, here, uh, the, uh, essentially what the cell wants to make sure of is that uh, whether all the DNA is fully replicated. Obviously, we know that if the, D the DNA is not fully replicated, uh, then uh, you, won't, you won't form what we call as the sister chromatids and therefore cannot uh, distribute a complete complement of uh, a genome in the forming daughter cells. And that's why we have the DNA replication checkpoint. And uh, it, this one checks for the presence of uh, the unreplicated DNA at the end of G2, okay, before the cell enters mitosis, okay? And then there is also what we call as the DNA damage checkpoint and which occurs right towards the end of G1 before uh, S phase begins. And of course, this makes uh, logical sense because um, the cell wants to ensure that be before the DNA replicates, uh, there are no damages like a breakage or deletions or uh, translocations or any kind of rearrangement in the DNA that might uh, co uh, cause a, uh, a, a mutations or, or uh, large-scale changes in, um, 
the, the genes in the DNA. So those kinds of damages first have to be repaired before the cells are allowed to enter into S phase. So if some da damage happens, then the DNA damage checkpoint will uh, step the brakes, um, so to speak, and uh, stalls the cell <coughs> and would not allow it to enter S phase until all of the DNA damage has been repaired. And once the damage has been repaired, then it allows the uh, cell to enter to S phase. And then in mitosis, in M phase, there is also what we call the spindle assembly checkpoint. Remember that uh, we have seen uh, the, uh, the, the profound damage that a, a um, defective spindle assembly can do in uh, mitosis and meiosis. They can cause uh, non-disjunction and a, a lot of, uh, of um, abnormalities in, um, in uh, organisms that, uh, and whose um, uh, gametes that form them uh, pass through uh, a defective uh, meiosis. And all of this is because of uh, abnormalities in the function of the spindle assembly. Therefore, the cell actually has a way of checking this also. So this is called spindle assembly checkpoint. And what it does is it checks all the chromosomes uh, being attached to the spindle before the cell progresses with mitosis in order to ensure that each daughter cell receives the full uh, copy of uh, the uh, genome. So to appreciate the uh, role of proteins in um, cell cycle checkpoint, let's focus on one very uh, well-studied uh, protein in this particular phenomenon called the P53 protein. Okay, uh, P53 protein is uh, involved in the uh, DNA damage checkpoint. And um, the, this protein, P53, um, uh, this is, in fact, uh, very sensitive to um, uh, DNA damage by um, radiations or chemicals. Um, what happens is that a specific protein kinase is activated that phosphorylates P53 uh, protein when the, 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 the uh, DNA is damaged. So there is a, uh, a sensor uh, an a kinase that detects any uh, uh, damage in the DNA, which then causes uh, P53 to be phosphorylated. Now, the phosphorylation of P53 prevents it from getting exported. So normally, when there is no damage, this P53 actually moves out of the nucleus. But uh, in the presence of a damage, it, this phosphorylation retains it inside the nucleus, and then the phosphorylation, uh, phosphorylated P53, P53 turns on genes that inhibit the cell cycle, okay? So inhibiting the cell cycle will then give the cell time to repair the DNA damage. And so it acts at uh, the uh, point just before the uh, transition from G1 to um, S. So we end this um, section uh, 11.5 with a second reef question. So please uh, open your reef account and um, try to answer this question also. Uh, so if a cell underwent mitosis and its daughter cells were immediately exposed to chemicals that damaged the DNA, at which stage of the cell cycle checkpoint would you predict the cell would uh, arrest? A, G1 checkpoint, B, G2 checkpoint, C, M checkpoint, or D, G1, G2, or the M checkpoints. Okay, so um, we need to uh, continue on with the final section of um, this chapter on section 11.6. So let's have a look now at the final section of this chapter, uh, section 11.6 on cancer. Your reading assignment for this section is found uh, on pages 245 through 247 of your textbook. 
The uh, major learning ob main learning objective of 11.6 is to identify the key features of cancer cells. Um, the uh, sub-objectives would be for you to be able to explain how improper regulation of the cell cycle can cause cancer. Uh, second, to evaluate the role of viruses carrying oncogenes to the development to the, the the, de the development of cancer, sorry. Um, third, to explain the relationship between viral oncogenes and cellular proto-oncogenes. Fourth, to describe the specific cellular functions that are regulated by oncogenes and proto-oncogenes. Uh, fifth, to describe the role of so-called tumor suppressor genes in cancer. And finally, explain why multiple mutations are required in order to cause cancer. There are two uh, self-assessment questions for this final section. First, how do oncogenes, proto-oncogenes, and tumor suppressor genes differ from one another? And what are the two ways in which the function of uh, P53, which we encountered in the previous section, can be disrupted. The uh, first evidence that uh, cancer uh, are caused by a special group of genes called oncogenes uh, were, uh, actually came about as a result of a uh, study in the early 1900s by a uh, medical scientist by the name of Peyton Rouse um, who studied a form of cancer called sarcoma in chickens. Uh, what he did was uh, he took a sample of uh, sarcoma from uh, a chicken that suffers from this um, um, cancer. And the sarcoma sample it was grounded, suspended, and centrifuge in order to make an extract. And in one of the experiments, what he did was he simply injected this extract into a healthy chicken and um, later on, he observed that this chicken developed a tumor at the site of injection. Um, the other part of his experiment was he took a sample from the original extract and passed it through a filter in order to remove uh, cells and uh, bacteria, and then did the same experiment. The filtered cell-free extract was injected into a healthy chicken and uh, found out that uh, despite the removal of cells and bacteria, the chicken still develop a tumor at the site of injection. So he concluded, therefore, that either a soluble chemical or a small uh, particle such as a virus is uh, capable of causing cancer. And later experiments proved that uh, it was indeed a virus. So based on this study in 1966, uh, Rouse was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or M Medicine. So what is cancer? The uh, core concept that uh, you need to um, um, remember in this uh, uh, section is that cancer is uncontrolled cell division that results from mutations in genes that control cell division. So... Um, in the Rouse experiment, the, the virus causing the cancer contains, an, in fact, an altered version of a gene that was normally found in the host animal cell that plays a role in embryonic development and is, in fact, involved in the control of cell division. This normal gene is called, uh, and other related genes are called proto-oncogenes. These are normal genes that are important in cell division that have the potential to become cancerous if mutated. So think of the cell cycle um, proteins um, that we learned in the previous section and try to figure out what um, sort of proteins that are involved in the progression of the cell cycle might be a good candidate to be proto-oncogenes. So these, are, these should be genes that if mutated will cause um, or trigger the uh, uncontrolled uh, process of cell division. So the oncogene, in fact, is simply what we call as cancer-causing genes, and they are a result of a mutation in um, genes that are involved in uh, cell division.
or the progression to uh, um, cell cycle, or even in in the uh, control or or monitoring or checkpoint of the cell cycle. Um, another type of uh, genes that um, are involved in cancer are called tumor suppressor genes. And tumor suppressor genes normally encode uh, uh, proteins that uh, inhibit cell division. So they are the ones that uh, tend to break um, cell division, especially if something is wrong during the cell cycle progression. And uh, mutations in these um, so-called checkpoint genes will allow um, cell cycle to proceed even though there is a dr damage in the DNA. And all of these can um, cascade in order to um, cause uh, cancerous growth. So um, today, the uh, r current model for cancer development involves uh, the uh, uh, occurrence of multiple mutations. Most human cancers uh, has been observed to require more than just the overactivation of one oncogene or the inactivation of, the, uh, of a single tumor suppressor. So when several different cell cycle regulators fail, for example, it is likely that cancer will develop. And the cancer may either be benign, meaning that it's slow growing and non-invasive to surrounding tissues, or alternatively, it may be malignant which means it grows rapidly and um, does not um, uh, recognize the inhibitory effect of its neighboring cells and invades uh, surrounding tissues. So the scenario is therefore that there is a gradual accumulation of mutations in multiple genes over a period of years. Uh, and this, this uh, gradual accumulation is correlated with a stepwise progression of cancer from um, benign to malignant forms, as illustrated in this figure here in 11.23. Yeah, so in normal cells, uh, occasionally you will get an inactivation of a tumor suppressor gene that is involved in, um, in let's say, um, a checkpoint such as P53, as we encountered. So P53 is a break in the cell cycle if there is DNA damage. If, uh, if something happens to P53, such as uh, a mutation, then uh, you cause the, uh, the loss of this break, and therefore you start to um, um, maybe create a benign um, cancer. This loss of a break can be coupled with the activation of an oncogene, and um, these two events may not necessarily uh, push the... Uh, uh, the cells to uh, uh, become malignant cells yet, but a, s a second event of inactivation of a tumor suppressor gene may uh, now push the uh, cell to become uh, malignant. And um, then another inactivation of a third supr suppressor gene will further exacerbate the uh, inability of cells to control cell division and they start to become metastatic and it becomes um, what we call as metastatic cancer and starts to migrate to a different site in order to uh, spread. So I would like you to consider carefully, you need to go back to um, uh, P53, for example, and, and, and see that figure on how it controls um, the progression of cell cycle or, or, or checks it and see what are the potential ways by which P53 can, uh, activity can be um, uh, uh, inactivated or misregulated. Uh, in that way, uh, you, you, you can um, make predictions on how uh, it can cause uh, the uh, 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 formation of uh, cancer growth. So uh, we, uh, we, we reached the end of uh, chapter 11, folks. Uh, so before uh, you exit, please make sure that you uh, answer this RIF question. Which of the choices would be most likely to lead to the development of cancer? A, the activation of a tumor suppressor gene. 
B. The activation of a proto-oncogene. C. The activation of an oncogene and the inactivation of a tumor suppressor gene. Or D. The activation of an oncogene and the activation of a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, <coughs> so this ends chapter 11, uh, which is the third segment of uh, Unit 3. And the final segment of Unit 3 that will be included in uh, exam number three will be uh, the next series of videos on um, DNA replication. And I believe that is chapter 12. Uh, the lecture videos will be provided by Professor Bosch. Thank you everyone for uh, sticking with me all the way from chapter five through uh, chapter 11. Thank you.